laptop manufacturers are lying to you. Every year, they come out with new devices that pack mind-blowing performance into ever smaller form factors. Take my Dell XPS 15 here as an example. It's barely thicker than a phone, and yet it packs an 8-core CPU, a dedicated GPU, and enough RAM and storage to sink a ship. So, What's the problem? Well, the problem is you only see that mind-blowing performance for the first 15 seconds or so. After that, the tiny little heat sinks in here, saturate with heat, and the whole machine has to thermal throttle in order to prevent itself from melting down. What you end up with is a device that basically never performs at the level that the manufacturer advertises. This is a problem that affects all but the chunkiest of laptops. So today, we're gonna try and fix that with a device that doesn't really work. Or at least it wouldn't work if you were to buy one at the store. We're gonna make our own, and I've got a couple of tricks up my sleeve that I think are actually gonna make it function. So let's head to the shop and find out. So the very first thing we're gonna do on this build is mill up some lumber, because as much as I wish this stuff came off of the tree perfectly straight and true, life just doesn't work like that. So while I handle that, why don't I tell you about the sponsor of today's video? Surfshark VPN. Chances are, if you're watching this project, then you care about getting the most out of your devices. So not only are we going to be upgrading the performance of my laptop today, hopefully anyways, we are going to be upgrading its functionality and its security by installing Surfshark. Surfshark is an award-winning VPN service that helps protect your online identity by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet. One of my favorite features of Surfshark is that you can use it to bypass geo restrictions on online content. As a Canadian, I constantly get frustrated that so many things aren't available to me online. But by using Surfshark, I can change my virtual location and access a ton of content that I wouldn't normally be able to enjoy. Surfshark has over 3,200 servers located in 100 different countries, so you can appear virtually anywhere. That's fun, but let's get serious for a second. What about digital security and digital privacy? Because what you do online is nobody's business but your own. ISPs, advertisers, and bad actors are all tracking your movements online for their own benefit. Surfshark puts an end to that by masking your IP address and allowing you to browse the web truly anonymously. Surfshark also blocks ads, malware, trackers, and prevents phishing attempts. You can also install it on all of your devices using a single account. Check out Surfshark.com and use promo code ZachBuilds to get three extra months for free when you first sign up. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in trying it out. I'll put some links down in the video description, and now let's get back to trying to squeeze as much performance as we can out of this laptop, because the whole security aspect of it's taken care of. Because this is me, of course I decided to make this thing out of solid walnut. However, since I know some of you at home may also want to tackle this build, I milled all of my wood to the same thickness as three-quarter plywood. That way, the two are interchangeable. I'll put a link in the video description where you can buy the CNC files I made, along with links to all the tools and materials that I'm going to use throughout this video. If your local mill is anything like mine, you're going to be pretty hard-pressed to find 12-inch wide boards in this thickness. But, lucky for us, we can just make our own with a quick panel glue-up. And, fun fact, did you know that wood, when properly glued together like this, is just as strong as if it was a single solid piece? It's pretty neat, right? After the glue set, it was time to load up the CNC, punch in a few parameters, and then start carving the two side panels. As you can see, both are identical, with one cut out for cable management, and one that will function as a carrying handle. I know the shape of these looks a little weird, but trust me, these side panels will connect with the top and bottom panels like big puzzle pieces. And speaking of, that is what I started to carve next. The top has this rather intricate hexagon pattern in it that will function like a grill for our poor overheating laptop, and then the bottom panel is quite simple, it's just got a small recessed area for some electronics. That, ladies and gentlemen, looks like a complete carve to me. Just take a second and appreciate how cool this looks. I love the little hexagon pattern here. Hexagons are bestagons, am I right? So, here we have our four main pieces. We got the bottom, and we have our two side pieces, which are going to slot together, uh, oh no, like this. And then we have the top piece here, which should go, yeah, like that. So, I mean, that's looking pretty complete as it is, actually. However, there are still a few things that we have to do. The first one here is pretty obvious. These side pieces are considerably thicker than they need to be. And that's simply because, well, 
I messed up a little bit. I had to make these side pieces a little bit taller. Here are the original ones, so you can see the new ones are actually three eighths of an inch bigger. Uh, just didn't quite get the clearance I needed on the inside, so I had to recut them. That's not a big deal. We'll run them through the drum sander and we will make them a little bit smaller. Next, if I take up this top piece here, you can see that I have this hexagon pattern that's gonna allow for some cooling. We'll get to that in a second, but there's actually a knot located in the wood here. And this little branch of the hexagon pattern is really, really thin and it's kind of scaring me. So we're gonna stabilize that with a little bit of CA glue before we go any further. Ideally, you'd avoid situations like this by planning your cuts around defects in your wood. But realistically, that doesn't always happen. So a little bit of CA glue will quickly stabilize small knots and cracks. And since I use Color Match Brown CA, you'll barely even be able to tell it's there. Just a couple of drops, a quick hit of accelerator spray, and it dries almost instantly. The last issue I'd like to tackle is actually a limitation of the CNC. You can see I have these box joints here and while they're cut pretty tightly vertically, you end up with these little spaces between them. And that's just because a CNC bit is round and it can't cut a tight inside corner. So what we're gonna do is just use a hammer and chisel, clean up those inside corners just a little bit and that should make it all fit together much nicer. You definitely don't wanna make these joints any bigger because they're already machine perfect. So all I did was just sharpen those inside corners using the existing lines of the box joint as a guide. And before moving on to the next step, I took this opportunity to cut six round pockets on the bottom of the bottom panel. These won't help performance, but they will allow this project to integrate much more neatly with my desk at home. But before we talk about that, let's just see how the box joints fit together. All right, there we go. Now that everything fits together a little bit nicer, we can move on to doing some uh, sanding as well as a little bit of pre-finishing. Obviously, nobody likes sanding but it's an important part of the process. Spending 10 minutes to smooth out all the surfaces and hard edges left by your CNC will make the final product that much more polished. It'll be both nicer to look at and nicer to interact with. And then I started the pre-finishing. You really ought to be pre-finishing your projects. This is something that I like to do when I know my finished shape is gonna have a bunch of tight interior corners or hard to reach places. It's just much easier to roll on a finish when everything is laid out flat. Just try not to make the same mistake that I made here. All right, there we go. That is not the final coat, but we'll do another final finish coat at the very end of the project. For now, I think we should just glue these guys together. Joining these pieces together should have been a cakewalk, but that mistake I made a second ago is kind of bugging me. You see, I accidentally rolled right over some of the mating surfaces of my box joints. Practically, this doesn't make a difference. These glue joints will still be plenty strong. However, it is a good practice to tape over all of your glue joints when you're pre-finishing so that mistakes like these don't happen. Just take this off of here. So. I'm sure many of you at home have now correctly surmised that what I'm building here is a laptop cooling pad. And like I said before, those don't really work, but I have some very special things planned for this that I think are actually going to make it work. Uh, let me show you the first one. This right here is a Noctua NF-A20. What it is, is a really big, really badass fan. With most fans, you have a little bit of a trade-off. The more air you want it to move, the faster it has to spin, and thus the more noise it makes. But this kind of gets around that by just being really big. So these blades don't actually have to spin all that fast. Come on, spin. These blades don't have to spin all that fast in order to move a lot of air. So this is going to move a crap ton of air, I think over 200 CFM, and it's basically gonna be silent. But before we can install it in the frame, we have to modify it a little bit. Optionality is always a good thing. As quiet as this fan is, there may be some situations where I don't want to run it. So I decided to add a little kill switch. By severing one of the wires that supplies power to the fan and wiring it through this push button, I can easily toggle it on and off. Plus, it'll be kind of fun to think of it like a turbo button. Just press here for more power. With that little mod taken care of, I screwed the fan to the underside of the top panel and then glued it in place just like I did with the bottom. So now we've added a fan to the bottom of this thing and it will blow air up through it and onto the bottom of the laptop, which is what every laptop cooling pad does. And like I said before, those don't really work because the problem is you're just blowing 
air against the bottom of the case and well that might help to cool things like one degree or two degrees. The heat generating components inside the laptop are not connected to the bottom of the case, so you're not really gonna be removing any heat from them. Lucky for me though, my laptop is made out of aluminum, so I think we might actually be able to change that. So here's the point of the video where I void the warranty on my expensive electronics. The first thing I had to do was remove the bottom panel from my laptop. This revealed a central heat sink that cools both the CPU and the GPU. Now, you don't need to remove it and do what I'm about to do, but this step alone can often drop the temperatures of your laptop by up to 10 degrees. So it's something worth thinking about doing, especially if you have an older laptop. What I did was remove the factory thermal paste with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and then replace it with some higher performance Noctua paste. This is a non-conductive paste and I'm applying it directly to the dyes of both the CPU and the GPU, so it's better to err on the side of adding too much and make sure that it's spread evenly over the surface of the dye. I also used some K5 Pro, which you can think of kind of like a viscous thermal pad, to repaste the GPU's RAM, as well as the VRM units to control power delivery to the laptop. These guys can get really hot during sustained workloads, and for their longevity, it's important to make sure that they are cooled as well as possible. K5 Pro is great because it can act as a thermal bridge on gaps up to two millimeters. And we'll use it more in a second, but first I had to remove this insulating mask applied to the bottom of my laptop. I suspect that Dell installs this here as an insulator to keep the skin temperature of the laptop as low as possible. This is good for user comfort, but it also stifles cooling and we're going for maximum performance here. That being said, I do think I came up with a good compromise between the two that we will discuss at the end of the video during the postmortem analysis. With the heat conducting aluminum shell now fully exposed, I was ready to use more K5 Pro in order to thermally bridge it to the heatsink. This will effectively turn the entire bottom of the laptop into one big heatsink. You'll notice I'm concentrating most of my efforts at the end of these heat pipes because that's where most of the cooling is designed to happen. See the fans here? This should help to keep the coolant inside the heat pipe circulating and the whole system operating as the engineers at Dell intended it to. A quick test fit showed me where I had too much and too little thermal putty, and after spreading it around a bit, I was finally ready to button my laptop back up. Hoo hoo hoo, all right. So, new thermal paste, new K5 Pro. On its own, that would increase performance by just giving it better cooling, but when you combine it with this laptop cooling pad, well then, it's really gonna turn the performance up to 11. So now at this point, we still have to sand and do the final finish of this thing, but I don't want you to tune out just yet because I actually have like two or three other features that I wanna add to this thing that are going to take it up to the next level because this is not just going to be a laptop cooling pad, but first, finish it. And this is why I like to pre-finish. Because we took care of all the heavy lifting earlier, this step was mostly just about cleaning up the glue joints and applying one last top coat. I was done in like 10 minutes. Now that is looking really nice now. Okay, so now that that's done, we can add our next feature. This is a Dell WD22 TB4, and it's a Thunderbolt 4 dock, and it fits conveniently inside the bottom of the stand. Not only will it supply power to the laptop simply by connecting this USB-C cable like that, but it also breaks out all of the ports. So you get a play port, HDMI, a bunch of USB ports, ethernet, and of course, two Thunderbolt 4 ports. It also powers the fan. So it's pretty cool, right? It adds a whole host of functionality to this. Well, this is now a laptop dock as opposed to just being a cooling pad. In order to attach it in there, we're just gonna use a little bit of Good old fashioned double-sided tape. Nothing too crazy here. Oh, these scissors are not sharp. <laughs> So in summation, we have upgraded the cooling with the fan. We've upgraded the functionality and the power delivery with the Thunderbolt dock. And there's still actually a couple of things that I want to do to this thing, but we have to use my 3D printer back home in order to do that. So we're going to go back there. We're going to do the benchmarking to see if this thing actually improved the performance of it. Ooh, I hope it did. And there's actually one bonus feature that I haven't even told you guys about yet. So yeah, let's head home and take care of those.
So, back here in the office, these 3D printers have been running overtime in order to create the last couple of pieces for this project. The first two aren't really that exciting, they're just these little bump stops that go at the back of the stand. I made them out of TPU, so they're soft, flexible, and should, you know, be very gentle on the laptop. Next, since Nocta isn't paying me anything, I made this little cover with my own logo on it to cover up the label on the fan. And if you look closely, you'll see that it's actually raised off the surface of the stand. This, in conjunction with these four corner pieces that I also printed, will raise my laptop up two millimeters off the surface and help to facilitate better, less turbulent airflow. They're also TPU, so they should help to act as like an anti-slip pad and keep the laptop from moving around on the surface of the stand. So now that we've got those little capstones out of the way, let's talk about performance. Did we make this thing perform any better? Well, in a word, yes but I think most people would probably say, hell yeah. When I started this project, I benchmarked the laptop and it was getting like 8,400, 8,300 points in Cinebench R23. Not bad, but you could see pretty much immediately the laptop would start to thermal throttle. Well, now we are mostly power constrained. And what that means is that we've removed the thermal constraint and the main constraint on this laptop now is that Dell and Intel just won't let any more power flow to the CPU. That's a good thing. With the laptop on the stand and the fan running, we are now scoring over 11,000 points in Cinebench. That's roughly a 30% increase in performance or kind of equivalent to a generational leap in performance. So I can probably now put off upgrading this laptop for another year. So yeah, I am very pumped on that front. Now, before we jump into the postmortem analysis, I have one last bonus feature that I want to share with you guys. Remember earlier when I bored out those holes on the bottom side of the stand? Well, I actually 3D printed these little TPU feet, embedded in them some very powerful magnets, and now, since I'm such a sick fuck, I can attach the dock to this drawer magnetically. So now I have not one, but actually two high powered PCs contained within my desk. And the way I did this is I basically just cut two metal bars, screwed them to the bottom of the drawer and attached them when nobody was looking. I also painted them brown to match too. All right, now that all the features are out of the way, let's talk about how I could have made this thing better in the post-mortem analysis. First off, size. I could have made this thing smaller or more compact if I had just spent a little bit more time designing it. As it is right now, it's pretty uncomfortable to use the built-in keyboard and trackpad on the laptop during long work sessions. So for the time being, I'll probably be limited to external peripherals. But the nice thing about it being this big is that if I ever decide to get a bigger laptop, then it'll still work. Second, and I'm sure many people have already thought about that, dumping all of that excess heat into the bottom shell of the laptop can be a little bit uncomfortable. Does it burn me? No, but I also wouldn't want to be using this on my bare legs. So in order to combat that, I've actually created some manual power limits that kick in when the laptop's on battery power. That way it only gets really hot when it's plugged into the dock. And then finally, last but not least, buying a Dell. Performance issues aside, I've had nothing but problems with this laptop since I bought it, and when it comes time to get another one, I'm going to be looking at other manufacturers. So if you guys have any recommendations down in the comments, let me know. I'd love to hear them. In my next video, I'm going to do something very similar for my Nintendo Switch, because I just found out that you can overclock this thing. So get subscribed so you don't miss that. Check out the CNC files and the 3D print files for this project. Big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.